Well, let's go ahead and get started. You ready? Okay. Turn with me in your Bibles to Acts chapter 26, beginning in chapter 1. And I'll give you a second to get there. Let me know when you're ready. Give me a thumbs up. Okay. Pastor Greg constantly exhorts us to... to uh, I'm sorry, I'll start all over. Pastor Greg constantly exhorts us on how we need to share the gospel. But unfortunately for most of us, I'm sure that this question comes up. How can I communicate the gospel, Mike? I'm glad you asked. In the passage that we're going to look at, we will uncover key components of Paul's defense of the faith. And also how we can use Paul as an example of how to effectively communicate the gospel. So by way of introduction, at the beginning of Acts 26, we find that many charges have been filed against Paul by the Jewish people, including the charge that he was against the law, against the temple, and against Caesar. Paul was in prison in Caesarea so he could be tried on these charges. But the truth was, Paul was innocent and none of these charges could ever stick. Yet because of politics, the Roman governors, first Felix and then Festus, did not set him free. When Paul saw that he was not receiving justice at the hands of these governors, he appealed as a Roman citizen to Caesar Nero for an opportunity to defend himself in Caesar's court. So to back up to Acts 25, King Agrippa II and Queen Bernice, who were living in an incestuous, rush, incestuous relationship as brother and sister, had come to pay the new governor Festus a visit in Caesarea. While they were there, Festus consulted with Agrippa as to what he should write on the charge sheet to be sent to Rome with Paul. When Agrippa heard that Paul was there, knowing who he was, he wanted to hear what he had to say. But just as Herod Antipas had wanted to hear Jesus Christ, not to believe him, but to be entertained by him, Agrippa likewise probably just wanted to be entertained and probably be stimulated in his mind by Paul's ideas. But what an audience Paul had. King, queen, governor, the leading citizens of the city, and leading Roman officials were all there. So to such a body, Paul made his defense and preached the gospel. But we neither crown nor a purple gown of royalty. Paul entered the place of Caesarea, the palace of Caesarea in chains, wearing a prisoner's tunic. But as we read the Bible, we see that the Holy Spirit was resting upon him, filling him with, filling him with wisdom and confidence. So we are about to embark on a most fascinating study as we examine the Apostle Paul's defense of the faith before King Agrippa. And I suppose you could say that this defense can be used to utilize what should be in essence communication skills that we can use in order to, for us to be effective for Christ. So to that end, by applying what we'll learn today, we'll be able to communicate the gospel. So read with me in Acts 26, starting with verse 1. Then Agrippa said to Paul, You are permitted to speak for yourself. So Paul stretched out his hand and answered for himself, I think myself happy, King Agrippa, because today I shall answer for myself before you concerning all things in which I am accused by the Jews, especially because you are an expert in all customs and questions which have to do with the Jews. Therefore I beg you to hear me patiently. My manner of life from my youth, which was spent from the beginning among my own nation and at Jerusalem, all the Jews know. They knew me from the first. They were, if they're willing to testify that according to the strictest sect of our religion, I lived a Pharisee. And now I stand and am judged for the hope of the promise made by God to our fathers. So this promise, our 12 tribes, earnestly seeking God night and day, hope to attain. For this hope's sake, King Agrippa, I am accused by the Jews. Why should it be thought that incredible by you that God raises the dead? Indeed, I myself thought I must do many things contrary to the name of Jesus of Nazareth. This also I did in Jerusalem, and many of the saints I shut up in prison, having received authority from the chief priests. And when they were put to death, I cast my vote against them, and I punished them often in every synagogue, and compelled them to blaspheme. And being exceedingly enraged against them, I persecuted even them to the foreign cities. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are thankful for the freedom that you have, that, you, that we still have to be able to praise, honor, glorify, and worship you, and study your most holy word, and have it speak to us down to the quarters of time. I know that every week your word, word speaks to us if we listen, 
But I pray especially today that we listen closely to what you've led me to share. Because I truly believe that there is something that each one of us can glean if we'll only ask you to clear all the structures from our hearts, minds, and souls so we can concentrate on what you'll teach us. Have your way with us, Lord, and have your spirit speak clearly through me today. And for this I ask and pray in Jesus' most precious and holy name. Amen. Let's get a drink of water here first. So in verse 1, Agrippa said to Paul, You are permitted to speak for yourself. This testimony of Paul was not a defense of himself. It was a declaration of the gospel with the evident purpose of winning Agrippa and others present to Christ. Paul stood before the man whose great-grandfather had tried to kill Jesus as a baby. His grandfather had John the Baptist beheaded. His father had martyred the first, first apostle, James. So Agrippa's family's history made him unlikely to receive Paul warmly. But Agrippa, like Herod Antipas before him, wanted to be entertained, and that was mind-stimulated by the apostles' ideas. Also wanting to help Festus find some charge to send a Caesar concerning Paul, he must have been eager to hear Paul's defense. So Luke tells us that King Agrippa gave Paul permission to speak. Without it, he wouldn't have had the grand opportunity to preach Christ. I believe it's for this reason that we're given a seemingly nebulous detail here in a loose record. The Holy, Holy Spirit wants us to know this. At first glance, Agrippa granting Paul permission to speak would be a firm grasp of the obvious. Yet it's written here in our Bibles. In other words, if this detail is important enough to include in this text, it must be important for us, important enough for us to take the time to know why. I would suggest this because, because we need to understand how critical and vital it is that we first have permission to speak into a person's life. Absent the green light, so to speak, if you will, we're in for a fight because, in, in effect, because we in effect spoil the sacred by giving our pearls to pigs, as it were. To expound on that thought, consider what Jesus said in Matthew, said in Matthew concerning receiving permission from someone to speak to them. Do not give what is holy to dogs, and do not throw your pearls before swine, or they will trample them under their feet and turn and tear you to pieces. The question we need to ask ourselves is this, are they looking for an answer, or are they looking for a fight? Paul knew that Festus and Agrippa were looking for answers, because they had to give an answer to Caesar regarding Paul. Suffice it to say that Paul knew he had a captive audience because the Lord had orchestrated and even choreographed all his steps. We need to discern and decide if we are wasting our time with those who have neither welcomed us nor given us permission to speak. Consider what Jesus said to Matthew in 10, 14, Matthew 10, 14 concerning this. Whoever does not receive you nor heed your words as you go out of that house or that city, shake the dust off their feet. So, the first step to effectively communicating the gospel is receive their permission. Paul goes out. So it goes on in verse 1. So Paul stretched out his hand and answered for himself. After receiving permission to speak for himself, we're told that Paul motioned with his hand. Paul had the wonderful ability to respect the position of authority, even if the person holding it was unworthy. This was a salute, a sign of respect. And then he began his defense by answering for himself. What's interesting about this is that Paul wasn't actually going to present his defense as much as he was going to, give, to present the gospel. Even more interesting is that he would do this by weaving, into, weaving it into how he, would, he himself could come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. We'll come to that shortly, but first I want to take a moment and look at Paul's motioning of his hand. Some believe that Paul was actually saluting King Agrippa in a way that would have shown respect for Agrippa's position of authority. This is remarkable given Agrippa's family history that bears repeating here. Agrippa's great-grandfather great tried to kill baby Jesus as a baby. His grandfather had John the Baptist beheaded, and his father had martyred the first apostle, James. If there ever was one who was unworthy of such a show of respect, it was Agrippa. This begs the question of why it is and how it is Paul would even, and could, and even could, be so respectful to one who is so unworthy of such respect. The apostle Peter gives us the answer to this question in his first epistle when he writes that we do it for the sake of the Lord, not men. As Christians, we should be good citizens submitting to government. This was very different from those zealous Jews in Peter's day, who recognized no king but God and paid taxes to no one except God. Peter wrote in the day, in, 
Peter wrote this in the days of the Roman Empire, which was not a democracy and it had, was no special friend of Christians, and he still recognized the legitimate authority of the Roman government, this is why we obey government. Since governments have the rightful authority from God, we are bound to obey them. One caveat being, though, they order us to do something that's in contradiction to God's law. Then we are commanded to obey God before man. But always remembering that we will likely have to pay consequences for our disobedience. But I digress. Peter also insisted that rulers were sent by him, that is, sent by God. Governments are sent by God for punishment of evildoers and recognition of those who do good. God uses governing authorities to check upon man's sinful desires and tendencies. Governments are a useful tool in resisting the effects of man's fallen nature. Based also on what God, Paul wrote in Romans 13, we can say that the greatest offense government can make is to fail to punish evildoers or to reward evildoers through corruption. Peter also knew, as I'm sure Paul did too, that our conduct is a way to defend the gospel. He knew that those who would never read the Bible would read our lives so it's by doing good that we silence the ignorance of foolish men. Lastly, we are warned against taking the liberty we have in Jesus as an excuse for sin. Instead, we use our liberty in Jesus to show the kind of love and respect that Peter calls for. We are to walk in purity and humility. So, the next step in effectively communing the gospel is show them respect. Paul continued, I think myself happy, Agrippa, King Agrippa, because today I shall answer for myself before you concerning all the things of which I am accused by the Jews. Though he was a prisoner, Paul was happy to speak before Agrippa. First, because he was pleased to have the evidence of his case examined closely by the highest officials, but also because he was pleased to preach the gospel to kings and rulers. Acts 25 tells us that in the auditorium in the city of Caesarea, Paul spoke to Festus, Agrippa, Bernice, commanders of the Roman legion, and all prominent men of Caesarea. This was a tremendous opportunity, and Paul was certainly happy for that opportunity. Paul began by acknowledging that he was fortunate to be standing before Agrippa as he defended himself against all the Jews' accusations. Now, it might stand a reason that Paul could be perceived as being disingenuous in an attempt to persuade Agrippa and win his favor. However, when you really understand what's going on here, it becomes clear that Paul considered himself fortunate for a different reason. It's important to remember that Paul had already made his appeal to Caesar, and it was Festus who was the one on the hot seat here. In other words, both Festus and Agrippa didn't really have any authority to pronounce judgment on Paul, let alone sentence him. So it wouldn't make sense if Paul was trying to smooth over Agrippa by saying he considered it a privilege to be standing before him. The reason Paul said this was because he deemed it a privilege and good fortune to be presenting his defense by presenting the gospel. Furthermore, Paul realized he had been a privileged recipient of God's calling on his life as a chosen vessel to stand before kings. This is evidence in Acts 9.15 in what Paul, the Lord said not an Ananias after Paul's conversion. He said, Go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and sons of Israel. So the next step in effectively communing the gospel is acknowledge the privilege. And Paul acknowledged the privilege. In verse 3, especially because Agrippa was an expert in all customs and questions would have to do with the Jews. Being half Jew and half Edomite, the Herods had a tremendous fascination with all things Jewish. They studied Judaism. They read Jewish history. They were intrigued by Jewish culture. Agrippa was considered an authority on Jewish affairs, Jewish scriptures, and Jewish conflicts. This was, this was one reason why eventually Rome appointed him as the curator of the temple, which meant he had the authority to appoint high priests and was also in charge of the temple uh, treasury. Paul knew this. I'm happy to talk to you, kid Agrippa, Paul said, because I know you understand our culture, our traditions, and our religion. Agrippa did. But when push came to shove, the same Agrippa would, would, in A.D. 70, join Titus in helping to destroy Jerusalem and the temple. Thus, Agrippa's interest was intellectual rather than heartfelt. What Paul then told Agrippa by the Holy Spirit was nothing shy of brilliant. He established a common ground from which to preach Christ. He did this by telling Agrippa that they had something in common, namely that, being, that of being well-versed in Jewish culture, tradition, and religion. Paul was being wise in what he did and said because he knew he was fortunate to have this opportunity and wanted to make the most of it. So the next step in effectively communicating the gospel, effectively communicating the gospel is 
establish common ground. Next, Paul continued, begging Agrippa to hear him patiently. This might take a while, said Paul, but give me some time and I'll explain the situation to you. Here Paul begged Agrippa to listen to him patiently because he was keenly aware that this was going to require patience on his part. If the truth be known, patience is what is required on both the part of the hearer and the part of the preacher when it comes to the gospel. It's interesting that in verse 28, which we won't read today, Agrippa asked Paul, do you think that in such a short time you can persuade me to be a Christian? Paul's response was even more interesting when he said, in effect, whether it was a short time or a long time, he was patiently praying to that end. Pastor Lloyd Pulley of Calvary Chapel, Old Bridge in New York, wrote a great book titled Patient Evangelism. In it he said, this is, this is good, when the Spirit leads us, we will not push people. We will not need to. We will sense whether there is an opportunity there or not. So the next step effectively, in effectively communicating the gospel is be very patient. Paul went on. My manner of life from my youth, which was spent from the beginning of, among my, nation of, my own nation of Israel, all the Jews know. They knew me from the first, if they were willing to testify that according to the strictest sect of our religion, I lived a Pharisee. So Paul went on to tell Agrippa that the, new, that the Jews knew how he had lived his life from when he was born to when he moved to and lived in Jerusalem. The Jews know where I'm coming from, Paul said. If they would come and testify, they would tell you, Agrippa, I was a Pharisee, the most orthodox of orthodox Jews, the most traditional, the most religious. Paul was saying that Jews could testify that he had lived as a Pharisee according to the strictest sect of their religion. So what was Paul doing here? He was telling his life story, and he started from the beginning from when he was born. This could take some time. Actually, Paul was sharing his testimony as he led up to how it was and when it was he met Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior. He was saving, saying that as a Pharisee, he was very religious, and because Agrippa was well acquainted with them, he would know this. Here's what we can learn from the beloved apostle. Never underestimate how powerful your story of coming to Christ is to others. One reason sharing your testimony when communicating the gospel is so powerful is that they can't argue with your salvation experience. But be that as it may, this is a communication skill must if we want to be effective in winning people to Christ. When people see that God can save us, he gives them hope that God can save them too, whether they're religious or wretch or both. Paul mentioned this when he wrote the first letter to the church in Corinth. He, in effect, reminded them of who they were before Christ. This is 1 Corinthians 6, 9-11. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you, but you were washed, but you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ by the Spirit of God. Here Paul spoke strongly to a brother who did wrong. Don't you realize how serious your sin is? The only thing you may gain from cheating your brother is an eternity with the unrighteous. Paul was not categorically denying a man's salvation. Paul said that he was among the brethren. However, Paul would not allow a religious faith that was separate from our actions. If a Christian can cheat and defraud his brother without conscience, it may be fairly asked if he's a Christian at all. This man who wronged his brother set himself in bad company with fornicators, idolaters, adulterers, homosexuals, sodomites, thieves, covetous, revilers, and extortioners. And none of those who live, live characterized by these sins will inherit the kingdom of God. No doubt the man figured, sure, what I'm doing to my brother isn't good, but it isn't that bad. Paul wanted him to know just how bad it was. We shouldn't think that a Christian who is committed to an act of fornication or homosexuality, homosexuality or any other listed sins is automatically excluded from the kingdom of God. In this list of sins, homosexuality, not some special version of homosexuality, is described, but it is described right along with other sins. Some who so strongly denounce homosexuals are guilty of other sins in this list. Can fornicators or adulterers or the covetous or drunkards rightly condemn homosexuals? Of course not. 
Christians err when they excuse when they excuse homosexuality and deny it as a sin, but they also err just as badly when they single it out as a sin God is uniquely angry with. So Paul's point is, such some such were some of you. Though these things characterize those who's, who will not inherit the kingdom of God, we as Christians can never be unloving or uncaring towards them because they are right where we used to be. Conversely, we should not and must not say such sins in the say such sins in the lives of those who don't know Jesus are of no concern of God. They are. Instead, we must communicate the message of salvation in Jesus Christ. He will save his people from their sins. At the same time, the point was plain for the Corinthian Christians and for us. And such were some of you. Paul clearly points this out in the past tense. These things were never the mark of a Christian. And if they do, they must immediately be repented of and forsaken. Well, let's concentrate on God's great work for us in Jesus Christ that is described in three terms. You were washed. We are washed clean from the sin by the mercy of God. We can have our sins washed away by calling on the name of the Lord. We are washed by the work of Jesus on the cross for, our, for, for us and by the word of God. You are sanctified. We are set apart away from the world unto God by the work of Jesus Christ on the cross, by God's word, by faith in Jesus, and by the Holy Spirit. You are justified. We are declared just before the court of God, not merely not guilty, but declared just before him. We are justified by God's grace through the work of Jesus on the cross, by faith and not by our own deeds. God can take the kind of people described in verses 9 and 10 and make them into the kind of people described in verse 11. How great is the work of God. Sorry, I derailed a little bit. <laughs> that was an important message. But regardless, there's an important lesson to learn from verses 4 and 5 that I repeat. Never underestimate how powerful the story of coming to Christ is to others. Because one reason sharing your testimony when communicating the gospel is so powerful is that the other person can't argue with your salvation experience. When people see that God can save us, it gives them the hope that God can save them too, whether they're religious or wretched or both. So the next step in effectively communicating the gospel is share your testimony. Okay, so Paul continued. And now I stand and am judged for the hope of the promise made by God to our fathers. To this promise our twelve tribes earnestly seeking God night and day hope to attain. For this hope's the sake, King Agrippa, I am accused by the Jews. Paul made it clear that in both his heart and his mind he remained a faithful Jew. His trust in Jesus was an outgrowth of his trust in the hope of the promise made by God. And he argued that for, his hopes that for this hope's sake, I am accused by the Jews. Paul said that it was because of his hope in God's promise to their forefathers that he was still on trial that, on that day before Agrippa. I stand here because of the hope of the promise made to our fathers, said Paul. Agrippa knew that the promise to which he referred was the Messiah. In other words, the issue is my belief in Jesus as Messiah, confronted Paul. But Paul was not just saying that the Savior had been sent as promised but that the promised Savior has been sent. Lest you think this is a play on words, it's not. Here's why. It's crucial we not only present the Savior, but we present in the promise, we present the promises first. When Paul wrote his letter to the church in Rome, he began by doing exactly what that, that when he mentioned God's promise beforehand in Romans 1, 1 through 4. And then he writes, Paul, a bondservant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated to the gospel of God, which he promised before, before through his prophets and the Holy Scriptures, concerning his son Jesus Christ our Lord, who was born of the seed of David according to the flesh, and declared to be the Son of God with the power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. The reason Paul presented the Messiah as, promised, as a promised Messiah is because it validated and authenticated God's word. When there is communication of the promise first, then our presentation of the Savior becomes a prophetic fulfillment of that promise. So, the next step in effectively communicating the gospel is proclaim God's promises. Paul then said something quite amazing. Why should it be thought that, incredible, 
why should it be thought incredible by you that God raises the dead? Oh, Agrippa, you know who the story, you know who, you who know the stories of the Bible, you who are aware of our history. Why should it seem like an amazing thing that you to you that God would raise the dead? Asked Paul, referring to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The same question could be asked today. People have trouble with miracles because they fail to comprehend the power and reality of God. You see, the difficulty of a task can only be determined when measured against the agent whose attempts to accomplish it. Some people contend that sometimes our God is indeed so small. If we, if we get hung up on the problems and the challenges before us, it becomes we, it, it's because we fail to realize the size, strength, and heart of our Father. To paraphrase Isaiah, the God, the God who made billions of stars in each Milky Way galaxy, and millions of galaxies, galaxies at least the size of the Milky Way, spans the entire universe between his thumb and his little finger. Our Father is big, yet he is the same God who made the atom, a miniature planetary system so small it takes one million bunched together to equal a thickness of a single strand of human hair. Now, do you think that, God, that the God who made these, the vastness of the universe and the intricacies of the atom can raise the dead? It all depends on your view of God. Most of us do not doubt the power of God, but we doubt his willingness to intervene in our situations personally. But I digress again. Verse 3 told us that Agrippa was an expert in all customs and questions which had to do with the Jews. He, could have under, he should have understood the belief that God could or would raise the dead. So why should it be thought incredible that God can do anything? As Jesus said in Matthew, with God all things are possible. Yet, it should have been especially easy for Agrippa to believe that God raises the dead, given some clear statement in the Old Testament, the nature of God and the intuitive grasp of the eternal among mankind. Paul took it up to the next level when he asked why any of them would think it's too incredible for God to raise someone from the dead. So what was Paul doing now? He was preaching Christ and him crucified by teaching the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. I suppose you could say that Paul was getting right to the point as he now repeated the very thing that got him in this mess to begin with. Perhaps the question was, why did Paul say this again and why, why now? I believe, it wasn't, I believe it wasn't just what he said, it's how he said it. Actually, he didn't even really say it. Rather, he asked about it. Notice that he brought up the resurrection, but it was in the form of a question. Why should it be thought incredible to you that God raises the dead? Because when you present a question to someone, whether it's rhetorical or not, they will try to answer it. In Paul's letter to the Romans, he presents five... So when Paul asked why it was incredible for God to raise the dead, Agrippa had to rethink the power of God and the power of the resurrection. Why was the resurrection so powerful? Because if he would, if he would do this for us, it means that God is for us and nothing can be against us. Why should he care about us? The answer lies in the cross. If God did not spare his only son that we might be saved, shall he not freely give us the things pertaining to life? He will supply everything that's good to us. How do we know? Because he's already gave us the very best when he gave us his son, Jesus Christ. So the next step in effectively communicating the gospel is preach the resurrection. Indeed, this is starting with verse 9. Indeed, I myself thought I must do many things contrary to the name of Jesus of Nazareth. This I also did in Jerusalem, and many of the saints I shut up in prison and received authority from the chief priests, and when they were put to death, I cast my vote against them. And I punished them often in, the very synagogue, in every synagogue, and compelled them to blaspheme, and being exceedingly enraged against them, I persecuted them even to foreign cities. Before his conversion, Paul was an angry man. 
His great rage showed that, he, that his relationship with God was not right, despite his diligent religious observance. He believed, Paul, he believed persecuting the followers of Jesus was a must. Some he imprisoned, some he killed, and some were forced to renounce Jesus. Paul would later speak of the great regret he had over his prior life as a persecutor, and perhaps the fact that he compelled them to blaspheme especially weighed in his conscience. But with verses 9 through 11 as a backdrop, lastly, Paul told Agrippa that like him, he too was convinced that it was up to him to do everything possible to oppose the name of Jesus. Paul admitted he did just that by persecuting and imprisoning many, imprisoning many saints who were put to death because of his vote against them. This clearly implies that Paul was a member of the Sanhedrin, having a vote against Christians who were tried before the Sanhedrin. Paul then described how he aggressively pursued and protest, protest, prosecuted Christians because he was obsessed in opposition against them. Now, at first glance, this may seem like, some, like something too personal, too much, too much personal information, causing one, one, one to wonder why Paul would be led to disclose this. But I would suggest to you that Paul is being very honest and very transparent. The reason I say this is because in verse 9 where Paul says, I myself thought I must do many things contrary to the name of Jesus of Nazareth. Nazareth. In other words, Agrippa, I too was like you once. In other words, Paul was being very candid and very transparent by becoming all things to all men he might, that he might save some. So, before I finish, there's something else here that could be easily missed as it relates to Paul being transparent about his past and who he is now, who he was now. Have you ever wondered why there's never mention of Paul's wife? Have you ever wondered why there's, I'm sorry, or if Paul was even married in the first place? But consider, as I mentioned earlier, Paul was a member of the Sanhedrin. This would also mean that at the time he was married, because marriage was required for all members of the Sanhedrin. So it may mean that Paul's wife either died or deserted him when he became a Christian. Be that as it may, it's clear that Paul later became single, and we see this when he writes his first letter to the church of Corinth. So what happened to Paul's marriage? The thought, that it, thought is that after Paul came to Christ, either his wife died or disowned him or deserted him. So why do I bring this up? And what's my point? Here's what I'm thinking. Paul was being real. If you remember, I mentioned earlier that Agrippa and Bernice were living in an incestuous relationship as brother and sister. Well, he knew that Agrippa knew all about the Jewish customs and the Sanhedrin requirements. So Paul, in effect, in effect, relating to Agrippa, who was sitting next to Bernice, discerning that she would likely desert him as if he were to ever become a Christian. So the last step in effectively communicating the gospel is be very transparent. So where does that leave us? You've been paying attention in an effective way to communicate the gospel. If you weren't to wrap things up, here's the Reader's Digest version. Number one, receive their permission. We need to understand how critical and vital it is that we first have permission to speak into a person's life. The question we need to ask ourselves is this. Are they looking for an answer or are they looking for a fight? Next is show them respect. Our conduct is, is a way to defend the gospel. Those who have never read the Bible will read our lives. We are to walk in purity and humility. Next is acknowledge the privilege. We should deem it a privilege and a good fortune to be presenting the gospel and being a privileged recipient of God's calling on our life as his ambassador. Next is establish the common ground. Establish what you have in common and how it can be used to share the gospel. Next, be very patient. Whether it take a short time or a long time, patiently pray to the end. When the Spirit leads us, we will not push people. We will not need to. We will sense whether there is an opportunity there or not. Next is share your testimony. Never underestimate how powerful your story of coming to Christ is to others. One reason sharing your testimony when communicating the gospel is so powerful is that the other person can't argue with your salvation experience. When people see that God can save us, it gives them the hope that God can save them too, whether they're a religious, a wretch, or both. Next is proclaim God's promises. Present the Messiah as the promised Messiah. It validates and authenticates God's word. When there is communication of the promise first, then our presentation of the Savior becomes a prophetic fulfillment of that promise. 
Next is preach the resurrection. Ask why it's incredible for God to, to raise the dead because it forces a person to rethink the power of God, the power of the resurrection. Why is the resurrection so powerful? Because if he would do this for us, it means that God is for us and nothing can be against us. Why should he care about us? The answer lies in the cross. If God did not spare his only son that we might be saved, will he not freely give us all things pertaining to life and supply everything that's good for us? How do we know? Because he already gave us the very best when he gave us his son, Jesus Christ. And lastly, be very transparent. Bottom line, be real. I would like to pose the we'll close the question. Why is it so crucial that we be very transparent? Because it is doing but because in doing so we showcase God's grace. Let's pray. Yeshua, I'll never understand how you can love us enough to go through the brutal pain and suffering and humiliation that you endured on the cross to redeem us. One thing I do know for sure is that you deserve every bit of praise, honor, glory, and worship that I can give you because of that. Mere words will never express the thankfulness that I have, so I'll just humbly say thank you. Thank you for saving me, Jesus. Thank you for saving us, Jesus. And because of that, we ask, ask, humbly ask your Holy Spirit, you Holy Spirit, to give us the power to apply what we've we learned today, to boldly and effectively communicate the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ to a dead and dying world. We ask this in your most precious and holy name. Amen.